Before we begin, dear listeners, a slight taciturn admonition. Tonight's episode is not for the faint of heart, even amongst our most enthusiastic of listeners. There will be elements of grotesquerie, body horror, and violence. Characters will endure and conduct unethical medical experimentation, often through the use of coercion. There will be unpleasant descriptions, and occasionally unpleasant sounds. Listen of your own volition, and remember this. You were warned. And now, without further ado, let us begin. Down, Mr. Kent. <laughs> Lieutenant said you want to make a statement. To talk to me. To confess. Mr. Kent. Mr. Kent, I don't have time for... I pray that God can forgive me my wrongdoing, because I deserve no such reprieve from man. Good. Now we're getting somewhere. So, you are ready to come clean, on the record? Mr. Kent. I am responsible. I am responsible for so much evil. Sure. All right. Now, what happened? Why'd you do it? Look, if you don't want to spill your funeral, because I hear they're looking for the chair, but if there were extenuating circumstances, maybe just get life. So, what's it going to be, Doctor? I am not a doctor. Yeah? Then what are you? It started, as so many of these stories do, with the war. I volunteered. I was one of the early ones. Joining up in the grand misguided belief I would be helping to save the world. I didn't want to be a soldier. I have never felt any desire to kill. To feel someone's blood on my hands and watch the life leave their eyes. Even then, I wanted to heal to ease pain and quiet suffering. I wanted to save humanity from itself. So I volunteered, and my eagerness gave me choices that were not available to conscripts. I became a medic. You saying this is all shell shock or something? Got your brains rattled over there and came home and started- Of course not, detective. I am as of sound mind now as I was then. Then what's this got to do with- I am answering the question that you put before me. What I am, what I became. Do we really got to go through- Fine. Sure. You want to talk? Talk. I will not bore you with stories of the war. You've likely heard too many. Perhaps even lived one yourself. In my life, the war is only important for how my time in it ended. I served for a little over two years. Thirty-one months. Thirty-one months in the dirt and the blood, sewing up bayonet wounds, removing bullets, amputating limbs destroyed by shrapnel. All with too few supplies, too little medicine. I wasn't qualified. Prior to enlisting, I had only slightly more than the standard education in human physiology. But on the front, one had no choice but to learn quickly or watch brave soldiers die under one's hands. So I learned. 31 months. 
It was like living in a waking nightmare. Long hours of heat and noise and pain and crying, bleeding bodies, punctuated by periods of boredom so intense one almost wished the battle would start again. I hated it, and in a way I loved it. I earned several promotions, both on my own merit and through the death of officers, and eventually found myself in charge of a field hospital. Had things continued as they begun, I could have come home if not an actual doctor, one who could fill the role in all but name. But things did not. I don't remember being injured. My memory extends as far as leaving the mess tent toward the latrines and then begins again in a bed in my own hospital, the right side of my body covered in bandages. It was an artillery shell. Shrapnel. Peppered my arm and shoulder with metal and nearly cost me my right eye. And, well, they say it killed me. I have been told my heart stopped at least twice, once in the field and once in the hospital while they worked to save me. Each time they were able to pull me back from the brink. Still I survived. Though my right arm and shoulder were damaged, irreparably, they said, and I nearly lost the vision in my right eye. They sent me home. Things weren't bad enough then to warrant keeping on a half-blind medic with only one good hand. I spent six months in the military hospital being rehabilitated. My vision recovered, my arm did not. Debris had lodged itself deep in the muscle. They couldn't remove it without risking the entire appendage, and I would not give up my arm. Because in that dark period of recovery, I found my purpose. What I was put on this earth to do. Heal. Treat the wounds existence gives to us all. Defend the common human from the illnesses that haunted them. Protect them from the charlatans that would deceive and abuse them. And I would not sacrifice my purpose just to save myself pain. And the pain was manageable with medication. Ether, morphine, laudanum, small amounts. Just enough to give myself some relief. To allow me to continue to work and study. Had small amounts continued to suffice, none of this would have ever happened. I was accepted to medical school on the strength of my service record, my status as a wounded veteran, and my extensive practical experience. I excelled, of course, but as time went by, my system grew acclimated to my medication, requiring me to increase the dose, and then to increase it further. When the need exceeded the amount I could obtain through official channels, I began to explore alternative means of obtaining it. In time, this drew the attention of the administration, and I was subsequently dismissed from the university. Still, despite everything, I retained my desire, my need, to heal. Which is how I met Dr. Albert von Leichenberg, and how I took the first step on the grisly path that drew me inexorably forward to where I find myself today. Right. Detective Eugene Clifford, 9th Precinct. Interviewing suspect. Please state your name for the record. Frederick Walter Kent. Interviewing Frederick Walter Kent regarding the discoveries made on 23 March 9930 Port Street. So, a dope fiend. That why you did it? You were melted? I am not an addict, detective. Right. <sighs> Perhaps at one time I might have required the habitual use of analgesics. That is no longer the case. <laughs> Whatever you say. So, then why did you do that? I will tell you everything, but you will need to stop interrupting me. Sure, Mr. Kent. Plenty of tape on that reel. You just go right ahead and keep on talking, and me and this machine here will listen. <sighs> Looking back, this in fact began the very moment the new tenant took up occupancy in the empty storefront just below the rooming house where I lived. At the time, however, I would have said it started with a sandwich board. White, neatly painted letters stating Dr. Albert von Leichenberg. Examinations performed... Diseases cured. Medicines dispensed. Teddy! Teddy! D 
dear, where are you? We're already late. I told Mama and Daddy we'd lunch with them before they leave this afternoon. Teddy! If you don't come down here right now, I'm going to come up myself and get you. Teddy! L- Lorraine? What are you... It's... You're quite early, uh, aren't you? Oh, Frederick Kent, don't tell me you lost track of the time again. It is 11.45. We'll only just make it uptown in time. <clears throat> I, um, I, I'm sorry, sweetheart. I That is my, my old injury. Oh, I'm so sorry, darling. I wish it would give you some peace. As a brave war hero and a doctor, you deserve I to be... I am not a doctor. Teddy! <laughs> well, take your medicine and come down. Make sure there are no marks on your pants and put on a clean shirt and a tie. Oh, that man. I simply do not know what I am going to do with him. Locked up in that stuffy old room, suffering rather than admit he needs his medication. Oh, sometimes I wonder why I... Oh, Now, well, very nice. You do clean up well. Now, we need to hurry if we want to be on time. And, of course, we want to be on time. You know how Daddy gets when someone is late. Yes, sweetheart, but Lorraine, you know how out of sorts I can be when my injury hurts in the night. Come along, Teddy. You did take your medicine, didn't you? Yes, but it it makes me so sleepy. Good. Now, now, come. We are going to be late. Oh! Excuse me. I am so sorry. Uh, Get out of the way! Uh, I I beg your pardon, dear lady, but you do seem to have run into me. Well, you're just standing there, right in the middle of the sidewalk, getting in the way of proper people. Who do you think you are, anyway? Someone apparently not permitted to stand on the street. My fiancé lives here. As do I, madam. Uh, Oh, you do? I haven't seen you. My tenancy has only recently been established. I'm a simple purveyor of medicinal care, hanging up my meager shingle, so to speak. Oh, you're a doctor! Oh, Teddy, how marvelous! A doctor! I am so pleased to meet you. I'm Lorraine Stanley, and this is my fiancé, Frederick Kent. He is also a student of medicine. Teddy, isn't that wonderful? Another doctor right downstairs. Now, sweetheart, I I don't think he's interested. Quite the contrary. You are a fellow practitioner, Mr. Kent. I, uh... That is, uh, I have studied some. He's taking a, 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 what did you call it, Teddy? A a sabbatical from his studies to do research. Isn't that right? Yes, Lorraine. I'm sure you two will have so much to talk about. But we really must go now. We're late. Come on, Teddy. Sweetheart, you really shouldn't have told him all that. He's practically a stranger. Now, really, dear, I know you want to get ahead on your own merits. And really, it's very admirable and all that, but you simply do not turn away a promising opportunity the world just drops in your lap. How on earth can you call that an opportunity? We know nothing about the man except his address. He's a doctor, isn't he? That's what he said, at any rate. Well then, see, an opportunity. And really, dear, if you won't let Daddy bring you into the company, you could at least accept my help here. I can help you make a connection. If you aren't returning to school this semester, you should at least find yourself a job. People are starting to talk. I told you, I have important research to be doing. That's wonderful, but that is not a job, Frederick. So do talk to the doctor. He seemed like such a perfect darling. I'm sure you two will be friends. Now hurry up. We'll miss the train. Telling me you were engaged to Lorraine Stanley of the Stanley family, the perfume people? Actually engaged? Yes. Right, and I'm going to the mayor's house for Sunday dinner. Pull the other one, it's got bells on. Believe it, I don't. It remains the truth. Sure, pal. 
So, Blankenberg moves in and you, what, ask him for a job? Good God, no. He disgusted me. I wanted nothing to do with the man or his so-called practice, especially when I began to hear the kinds of conditions he claimed he could treat. Huh? He was clearly a fraud, a charlatan, a swindler peddling snake oil in the guise of medicine. But you were his partner. Eventually, yes. When I saw the actual results of his work. But not at first. I don't know, Ken. Of course you don't, detective. I presume you're a good person who wishes the best for his fellow humans. <laughs> sure. Good people often find it difficult to conceive of the ways men have found to manipulate their fellow men, especially for profit, and I regret to say that many of those ways involve dubious cures and medicine that is little better than poison. You thought he was a con, got it. How'd you end up working for them, then? <laughs> I sought to expose his lies. What? I attempted to demonstrate he was a fraud, and in so doing instead proved his abilities, and in my hubris allowed a great evil to live and grow. Good morning, Mrs. Bratz. Good morning, dear. You're up and about early. Ah, uh, dear... Pain, I'm afraid. No rest for the wicked. Oh, why a good man like you was given so many troubles. <laughs> you should take an umbrella if you'll be gone long. It looks like rain. And do be sure to be back for dinner. I'm roasting a chicken. I will endeavour to do so. Oh, have you met the new tenant, dear? He just moved in downstairs. Such a dignified man. A doctor just like you, if you can believe it. I'm not a doctor. Oh, of course, dear. This doctor, he has such a fancy name, has already been such a help. The medicine he gave me cleared my catarrh right up. You know how it hangs this time of year. Mrs. Bratz, you didn't take one of his... his potions, did you? Of course. They're in the office. One dose, he said, and I'd be right as rain. Do you even know what it was? Well, no, but I'm not a doctor. It could have been anything. He could have poisoned you. <laughs> you will make your little jokes. I mean it, Mrs. Bratz. Don't take anything from that man. Really, dear? If I didn't know better, I'd think you're jealous. He's been a perfect blessing to the street and your neighbours. Others have gone to him for treatment. Well, only the sick ones. A but and they've have all to... been perfectly fine. Better than fine. You know little Andy, Muriel's boy? The kind of puny one. The doctor gave him something and he grew three whole inches. Practically overnight. That is impossible. I, I'd have thought so too if I hadn't seen it with my own eyes. And he healed Hannah's broken arm right in front of us. And every single one of the Cook children, who all had scarlet fever. If I weren't a Christian woman, I'd say the doctor was performing miracles. Mrs. Bratz, do not trust that man. He is fooling everyone, tricking and swindling you. Mr. Kent, I won't have you talking like that about one of my tenants. He is helping people. Go meet him yourself. You'll see who he really is. I will, and you'll find it is I who will show you who he really is. say this is making you look so good, Mr. Kent. From where I sit, it sounds like Dr. Leichenberg was a stand-up guy, and you had it out for him from the start. Beg your pardon. Just the way I see it, he didn't do anything wrong. At least, if he did, he didn't tell me about it. He was lying, deceiving, pretending to be a man of medicine, charging people for, for rubbing alcohol and ink. Sure, but People got better, right? They appeared to. Then don't seem like it mattered as much what he was doing, so long as it worked. But it couldn't work. <laughs> Sounds like you just didn't like that it did. This was not some sort of irrational grudge, detective. I am a man of science. 
What I was being told was impossible. I could not stand by and allow people to be fleeced. Not by someone who is not even a real MD. He shouldn't have got paid for treating people, that's it. If he didn't have the letters after his name. Detective, he was a monster. So you were saying. I don't see it. Maybe he didn't begin as one. But over time, he became... That would be while you were working for him, wouldn't it? I... That is... So how did that happen? Sounds like you couldn't stand the guy. How come you end up his right-hand man? I didn't... I didn't mean for it to happen. People usually don't. I thought that I could prove he was a fraud. That I could use my own condition as a means of verifying his medicines were acting as placebos at best. I went to him for treatment to demonstrate he could no more cure someone than than you could. How'd that work out for you? Hello? Is anyone here? I'm here to be seen? Um, Mr. Uh, Dr. Von Leichenberg? A blessing on the neighborhood, a blessing. Working miracles. Well, let's see if this blessing can perform a miracle on my arm or if he's as useless as every other self-proclaimed healer. Good afternoon. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. I did not intend to startle you. How can I help you, Mr. Kent? Um, y yes, well, oh, um, hello, yes. Uh, how, how did you know who I was? <laughs> I make it my business to know the people among whom I live, and indeed work. Of course you do. So, then, Mr. Kent, what is it that I can do for you? I want to try some of your medicine. You're feeling unwell, then? I, uh, yes. Yes, I am. I see. You know... Honestly, I had not thought one such as yourself would seek out the services of a simple physician such as myself. I, um, that is, <coughs> Mrs. Bratz spoke highly of you. Is that right? <laughs> well then, if you are ill, I will see what I might do to improve your outlook. If you will come with me, please. Uh, where? <laughs> to the exam room. Where else? It would hardly be professional, or indeed polite, to assess you here, in front of the windows. Oh, oh. yes. Right. Of course. Then, shall we? Uh, yes. Yes. Now, Mr. Kent, what is the nature of the illness that brings you to me? Uh, not an illness, precisely. Uh, an old injury, but one that still gives me trouble. Uh, my arm. During the war, uh, they say metal lodged in the muscle. I can raise it, like this, but no further and use my hand, but uh, as you can see, the tremors begin almost immediately. Mm -hmm. I was told you would be able to help, that you could repair damage other doctors called irreversible. Ah, uh, yes. Well, so it's been said, so it's been said. It brings you pain, yes? And you take something to relieve it? From time to time. It becomes particularly acute. <laughs> Tincture of opium? Laudanum. 
infrequently and in quite small amounts, of course. Oh, of course. Yes, Mr. Kent. I believe I can help you, if you'll let me. What happens next sounds more fantastical every time I relate it, but I swear to you what I'm about to say is the entire truth. He briefly left the room, through the door that led deeper into the building, and returned a few moments later with a bottle. Brown glass, like any ordinary medicine might be dispensed in. From a cabinet, he produced a sherry glass. Watching me, smiling all the while, he poured out a measure of brownish-white liquid. It was... strange. Cloudy and opaque, with particles of some sort swirling, suspended in it. As I looked, they seemed to almost twist into letters, but never quite ones I could recognize. Smile never changing, the doctor held it out. I would be a liar if I denied that at that moment I was afraid. The room had gone suddenly very cold and completely silent. I could not take my eyes from the liquid, from the way the eddies in it seemed to spell words I could not read. For a long moment I hesitated. But I had come here for the public good. To reveal another false healer, preying on the common man. So I screwed up my resolve, took the glass, and drank. What happened? The liquid ran down my throat at once burning hot and frozen, and then it was as if I had taken hold of a live wire. Electric current ran through my veins, with pain that was not pain. I could feel each vein, each artery, as it branched smaller and smaller vessels across my torso and down my arms. I became aware of each minuscule tubule, each cell of my blood, as it passed through them. I could feel them move, feel the tiny charges they sent between them. And then... <sighs> English lacks the words to describe what I felt. Pain, yes, agony but pain with a dimension and depth that it entranced even as it hurt. Fascinating pain that pulled me in and dragged me down, cradled me inside it, shot spots of light across my vision, swirling in the same impossible letters as the medicine. I wanted to die. But even as I wished it, I wanted the pain to continue, so I could continue to learn the secrets contained in its multitudes. <laughs> when the metal began to push its way out of me. Some insects lay their eggs in living creatures, leaving their young to hatch and eat their way out from the inside. The healing of my wound was as I imagine those poor beasts must feel. And then... I was well. Truly well. Healthy and complete in a way I had not been since the explosion that removed me from the front. Not only was there no pain, no pain at all, but no longer was the echo of pain, the anticipation of suffering that would inevitably come. I moved my arm, bent the shoulder, the elbow, extended, flexed. It moved as it should, the joints shifting effortlessly. Even the scars that had peppered my skin had vanished, and more. The need was gone as well. The, uh... I was clear-headed, completely clear-headed, had lost the need to dull my senses. The, uh, the effects of the laudanum were gone, but there was no need to bring them back. No more pull to give myself chemical relief from either physical or mental pain because I felt neither. The compulsion that had held me for so long was broken. The doctor had freed me from the prison of my body and from the prison of my mind. And in that moment, I knew that it was my mission, my purpose, to help him free others. Oh, well, I'm fat trout. I need a break. You want anything, Mr. Kent? Coffee? Cigarette? No, thank you. Do you mind if I... Go ahead. Oh, 
keep meaning to give them up. Don't know why I never get around to it. You're dependent on the nicotine. Hmm? Addicted. Hmm. Guess that makes sense. So, what you were saying before is that you used to be a junkie. Then the doctor fixed you up and got the monkey off your back. He... I suppose that's true, if you distill a profound experience down to an extremely prosaic idiom. And he fixed your arm. He didn't simply fix my arm, detective. It was as if he gave me a new one. It was... perfect. In every way. Skin unscarred and smooth, as soft as if it belonged to an infant, and not a 26-year-old man who'd been through a war. That done is impossible. Exactly. It wasn't. Or shouldn't have been. It was, in fact, as the eloquent Mrs. Bronze had said, a miracle. So, then what happened? Then, I must reluctantly admit, I had something of a crisis of faith. How do you feel, Mr. Kent? I feel... I feel... wonderful. Ah. Dr. Leichenberg, are you all right? Yes. Yes. Quite fine. Thank you. Do you need anything? Water? (coughs) No, no. Thank you. Thank you for your concern. But please, don't worry yourself. At times, I simply feel my age. Now, are you happy with the results, Mr. Kent? Your arm? I am. Yes. I... Dr. Leichenberg. Please, Mr. Kent. Albert. We are brothers in science, are we not? Then please, call me Frederick. Frederick, then. If you are satisfied with the treatment... Dr. Albert, I... I'm afraid I allowed myself to make a judgment without sufficient data, and came to a flawed conclusion about you, and may have done you and myself a disservice. Oh? I considered you a liar and a swindler, and I was not private with my opinion. But you feel that way no longer? I see now you are... You have... I... They say that there are no atheists in foxholes, but somehow I managed. I have wanted to believe in something, anything, for my entire life. I never could. Especially after I was hurt. After I died and found there to be nothing there. Not even the awareness of nothing itself. I... No one who has ever claimed to be anything more than fallible flesh and blood humans has ever proven that to be true. However many I have sought out, each one has been a more disappointing fraud than the last, but you... What I experienced here was real. And I... I want... Can it be taught? What you did? Can I... Can one... Learn? That is a most serious thing you ask. Perhaps even more so than you realize. But, if you are sincere, then we shall talk further and determine the course of our partnership. <laughs> <laughs>